just like every animal or plant, each ambrosia beetle also has their own lifestyle, their own specialty, their own trick. They're not a homogeneous group. Each group has devised a special strategy that allows it to survive. Like these twig borers, they reside in twigs that dry up quickly, they rot quickly, so these borers usually have to get in and out, they have limited number of larvae and eggs. The huge advantage though is that their breeding material is everywhere. Unlimited supply. This is Coptoborus, a genus typical for small branches. This is Zalosandrus morigerus. It is one of the world's most widely distributed ambrosia beetles. It's a tiny little twig beetle. It could be a pest, and here it is invasive. Look at its super lush fungus garden, though. Like all ambrosia beetles in the genus Zalosandrus, it cultures ambrosiella. The biggest abundance of ambrosia beetles is in large fallen trees. Look underneath this tree. There is so much sawdust. Literally kilos and removed from the inside of the tree to make space for the ambrosia fungi to dominate in this tree. This type of ecosystem, these large trunks, are typically dominated by the platypodine or platypodine. Uh, pinhole borer ambrosia beetles plus Zaleborus. Sure, the termites are interesting, but look at the hole. This is Mega Platypus, and look, someone's home. What happens if we disturb him? Oh, he's kicking. Do you see that? He's kicking. People think it's the ornamentation on the declivity that's somehow defensive, but the truth is that it's the legs that they use for defense. The declivity is for female to recognize the right male. Oh, now I get a kick. And if I try to grab him and pull him out, I'm sure you're thinking of that, I would destroy his body because his other legs are made to pry himself in the gallery and he just wouldn't come out never ever you would tear off his butt before he would let go and that's why to collect these we have to cut the wood and split open his gallery This is a very large trunk, so the way to sample ambrosia beetles from a very large trunk is to make cookies, just like with any other wood, except you have to have a chainsaw. And with these cookies, you just sit here and keep chipping with your clippers. Beetles. So now we have the cookie, this is where the male is, and this is how we will split it in half so that we get the male out, and of course the rest of the gallery. Alright, here he is. Look at that monster. Notice that when he's out of the gallery, he doesn't know how to walk. He doesn't have any tarsi, any feet. They lose them inside the tunnel because they don't need them. They essentially walk on their elbows. That's how adapted they are to the tunnel life. Do you hear him screaming? This bzz, bzz, bzz. That's a distress call.
and there is the female here so again we will very carefully remove this part of the wood from her to expose her we never pull beetles out of wood they would crush them we pull wood out of the beetles i don't know what she's doing here in most species the old female when she's done laying eggs she dies at the end of one of her many extensive tunnels in this case she is hanging out here at the very entrance with the male i know that this is the old female because she doesn't have any tarsi any of the legs so she can't really walk properly and because she was facing with the abdomen out if this was the new generation one of the daughters she would be facing the face out about to come out she would talk to her dad to let, let her out and he would do that but this is the old female there are just so many mysteries you know how did she even get here considering that the gallery is full of larvae these are platypodine larvae there can be hundreds in the tunnels platypodines make very extensive systems of tunnels sometimes multiple layers or stairwells through the tree notice the larvae don't know how to walk when they're outside of a tunnel they can only walk through a tunnel and very fast also notice the black stuff the layer on the surface of the tunnel some people say it's the symbiotic fungus some people say it's a reaction of the wood we don't really know really there are so many mysteries about these beetles that we haven't figured out yet they frequently have these eggs distributing them through the gallery i don't know how that works here is a larva again with a bunch of eggs how do they get them from the female that's all the way on the other side of the gallery maybe when the national science foundation funds us again we will be able to answer these mysteries oh and there's a tiny little larva look at that just hatched this is a very typical movement for platyponine larvae super cute so here is the final sample you have the male the female an old larva a young larva the egg and a piece of the wood with the fungus growing on it and of course a label with all the information we call this an extended sample you can extract dna from all three members of the ecosystem now what's also remarkable is that this wood is riddled with these little galleries which are zaleborus zaleborus affinis and ferruginous two most successful ambrosia beetles in this region by far like orders of magnitude more common than any other species my hypothesis is that it's because of their fungus that resides in the wood for a long time and that allows them to have overlapping generations in each piece of wood many generations here is alibur's affinis and you see the goopy stuff lining the tunnel wall that's the fruiting body of the fungus that's what the beetles eat otherwise the fungus is, is of course spread out throughout the wood these are very social beetle they recognize their families they recognize their species they frequently communicate in the tunnel You see one? Yeah, I got one on yeah. my hand. Yeah. Slowly crawling. So do they grow more bigger than these ones? They won't grow very much anymore. They will stay a little. They are not big, but there are many of them. Yeah. That's their advantage. In terms of the trunk dwelling ambrosia beetles, it looks like their main advantage is that they can dominate in the trunk. In other words, their fungi 
that are inoculated by thousands of beetles can totally take over even a large trunk of a fallen tree. This was nicely shown by my colleague James Skelton in Florida, but it looks like it's even more true throughout the tropics. Wherever a big tree falls, it is immediately colonized by a couple of species of very abundant ambrosia beetles and their fungi end up dominating the whole trunk. These trees that are completely saturated by ambrosia beetles, which is a normal condition in a rainforest in most of the tropics, it reminds you that the beetles and their fungi really are a driving force in the decomposition of the wood. Turns out though, as our research shows, they're not speeding up the decomposition, they're slowing it down because they dominate the wood when it falls and kick out other fungi. So either their fungus is super competitive, that it supports multiple generations, or it just establishes first and gets a hold of a large area and doesn't let any other fungus grow there. And deep inside this trunk are the Platypodinae beetle pupation chambers. That's where their larvae turn into pupae and then into adults. This is Euplatypus. Each larva comfortably nestled in its own chamber. This is literally right in the middle of the trunk. After pupation, the beetles obviously need to leave and they emerge through the surface. Sometimes when you remove these piles of sawdust, you make it easier for them to fly out. So let's see if we can find any that are, that are waiting. Here, they're flying out. These are Euplatypus, super agile beetles. They're flying out like a swarm of flies. And here is my snack for the morning. Guess what it is. Raw chocolate from this farm. Mmm. Yum, yum. Earlier today, I collected beetles from this log. Tonight, I'm testing my new UV lamp battery powered to see if it can attract any ambrosia beetles and if this UV light trap is a good way to collect them. Ha! Did it work? Look! All of these ambrosia beetles. This is just a ridiculous abundance. So yes, this battery powered UV light method absolutely works. Sometimes biologists like to study the rare things, but I think in this case, the common things are actually really interesting because they figured something out. Something that other species haven't.